Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Emma Shepherd, and I'm the founder of the Maternity Teacher Paternity Teacher Project. Um, I recognise a few of you, a few of names from our social media platforms and from our WhatsApp communities. So really great to, to see you here today. Um, I am uh, going to be running through today how you might want to, things that you might want to consider when you're returning to work um, or making a flexible working request uh, as you step back into the classroom after either a period of uh, adoption, um, maternity or shared parental leave, or I know that we've got a few people here who've taken extended uh, caring related break today. So I'll start the session by giving you quite a bit of information, legal information, and that's part of why the recording is there so that it's available afterwards if you want to check back on, on anything on Pioneer's website, or if there is, um, if there are other people who had a last minute emergency with baby today and so couldn't quite join us. Um, if you have the ability to make notes at that point, um, then that might be helpful to have a pen and paper available. Um, but we will also have the chance to ask questions um, at the end of that block of information, um, share any um, thoughts um, or ask for repetition. And then the, the middle part of the session will be all about um, setting you up with some, some information, but then asking you to reflect and share either in the chat um, or in breakout rooms. So we'll break you out into pairs. Now, anything that you do or say in the breakout rooms um, will not be recorded. So you don't have to worry about any um, anybody spying on that, as it were. So if you are able to, to make notes um, this morning, I know that sometimes that's a bit tricky with babies uh, in hand, but I do have some strategies when we get to them, if that is going to be a bit of a, a note making barrier for you. Um, I'm more than happy uh, for you to have cameras on or off as you please when we're in the main room. Um, sometimes it is helpful to, to see your faces so that I know whether you find my jokes funny. Um, but other than that, I appreciate that sometimes it's not the most convenient thing if you're um, managing baby as well. Um, if you are in the main room, please keep the mute buttons on. But then when you're in the breakout rooms, please uh, unmute, get those cameras on and get ready to share. Um, and just a, a willingness to share this session. There'll be a couple of opportunities to, to contribute uh, either in the chat or in the breakout rooms. Whilst we're doing so, can I please remind you um, to be professional, especially if you are talking about um, some difficulties that you're experiencing with your school. Um, just uh, a reminder to, to be as anonymous as you can. Um, this session is confidential uh, in, as far as we're concerned. So anything that you share in the chat won't be, um, won't be shared. I will be reading some of the comments out loud, but if I see a comment that's a trickier one, I will acknowledge that, but not read it out loud for the sake of the recording. And please be conscious that if anybody's sharing anything with you in the breakout rooms, then that's confidential as well. Um, so please be sensitive to that. Also, please do use the breakout rooms when you're with people to share contact details, um, if you'd like to stay connected with somebody. So, as we're, as we're going through the information today, please uh, consider for this first block any questions that you have, any stories of success from yourself or your colleagues or wider networks that you know, anything that you want me to repeat again, and any school specific contexts or barriers. Um, and if we read those out, I won't include your name there just so that we can discuss those a little bit. I won't be looking at the chat until the end of the, the first block of legal information. Um, but when I get to the chat, I will uh, hopefully see some, some thoughts from you there. So first up, some legalities to, to be aware of when it comes to flexible working. All employees have the right, um, the legal right to request flexible working. It's not just for parents, um, it's not just for mums, and, and you don't have to justify why you're making your flexible working request. Um, it's just that everybody has the right to request it. However, you must have been uh, in with your employer um, for at least 26 weeks to be eligible to make a flexible working request. The reason the star is there is that sometimes if you move between authorities, um, local authorities or schools in the same academy chain, then um, there's a negotiation that can happen there. Or sometimes um, if you are applying for a new job, um, you can negotiate flexible working uh, for your start date, even if you haven't uh, worked there before. There's also um, some movements uh, in Parliament to uh, make it 
um, make flexible working available from day one for every employee in every industry. Um, that hasn't gone through yet, but that's what, um, what people are working on. And Pregnant and Screwed, who we'll talk about a little bit in this session towards the end, um, have also been quite um, influential with that movement, which is great. They're a great organisation to follow if you don't know them already. Your employer is legally bound to deal with your request in a reasonable manner, which, uh, like a great deal of government guidance, is sufficiently vague enough for um, discrimination to happen um, without it being very easy to prove that discrimination. So this is why we, we share these legal information with you so that you feel empowered to know what, what is and isn't allowed. Um, employers can refuse an application if they have what's called a good business reason for doing so. And for us as schools, a good business reason means the a detrimental impact on students and colleagues. So if it, you working flexibly or part time would mean a bad deal for your students or your colleagues, then they can say no to it. Um, your employers, once you've put your flexible working request in writing, they have to come to a decision within three months. Often schools do it much quicker than that. Um, but in terms of what you can expect from them, they have a legal right to wait three months before approving or denying. Um, so often um, we can submit our flexible working request and then get a bit edgy because we, we haven't heard back within a week. Um, they do have three months to, to keep you waiting if they want to. Um, if your request is approved, then the terms and conditions in your contract have to be changed. Um, so when you go back to work, you should be going back on a new contract that says very clearly um, what days you're working or what, what number of hours you're working, um, whether that's 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, and any other terms and conditions in terms of the inset days that you're supposed to be attending, um, extracurricular and TLRs, how that works, pro bono, etc., uh, pro bono, pro rata, et cetera. If um, your request is denied, your employer has to explain the business reasons for the denial in writing. So they can't just say to you in a meeting um, after three months, we're, we're saying no to your flexible working request because it's just not going to work for the students. They actually have to put in writing um, that they feel that the students would be uh, detrimentally impacted in um, ways X and Y, or that the team wouldn't be able to function uh, to its full capacity or the way that it needs to for X and Y reasons. So they do have to be specific about the business reasons for the denial. Um, in some cases, it might just be a case of the timetable has already been written and we won't be able to um, afford or won't have the time to advertise to cover those, those hours before, before this point. Now, if um, you don't agree with what they've said, or if they haven't give you, given you clear business reasons, or they haven't done it in writing, then you have the right to complain to an employment tribunal. And your union and uh, Pregnant and Screwed or Citizens Advice are the people who can support with that legally. So that's Pregnant and Screwed, your union or Citizens Advice. Now, here's where um, your responsibilities come in, because it's important to remember that when it comes to flexible working requests, it is, it's a negotiation between you and the school. And um, what the trap that I think individuals often fall into is expecting um, the school to do all the solutions and the creative thinking for them, when actually they, individuals, we need to know what we're talking about as well. So what you have to do is put your request in writing. And if your school has um, an, a specific form attached to their flexible working policy. They should have a flexible working policy. If they don't, um, you can raise the fact that they should have one and you can't find it and where is it? Uh, because that's an HR requirement. Um, but often they have a, like a pro forma at the back of that as an appendix um, to use. And that will often ask you um, the specifics of what you're asking for, um, the impact on your students and your teams um, and how you sort of anticipate it looking in the day-to-day -day. so you have to sort of paint the vision for them however as it currently stands you can only submit one application per year so what we suggest is that um, you you have a very good understanding of your flexible working policy so get hold of it if you haven't already um, and that before you actually put your application in writing you have informal conversations with your line managers, with your heads of department, with the people who are going to be implicated in your flexible working request. Because if, for example, um, the timetable is written in January with an understanding that you'll be coming back full time and you pet, put your flexible working request in um, you know, this week, 
um, but the timetable's already been written and the cover supervisor's contract, the cover person's contract has been ended, um, then your school will be put in this bind because they'll say, well, we have to say no to this flexible working application. But if you'd waited, we could have organised this for September. But now that you've put that flexible working um, request in, you can only do one a year. So from September, you're going to have to carry on working full time and wait until next February to, to submit a new flexible working application. So it's always a good idea to, to have informal conversations first um, before, before you actually put what you're asking for in writing so that if your school are willing, they're not sort of had their arms twisted to say no because of this one application per year rule. Um, when writing this application, and we'll look at some models later, um, we really, we, you need to put your students and your colleagues at the heart of everything that you're saying. So whilst we know that flexible working um, might enable you to manage your caring responsibilities better or to have um, a better work-life balance or to um, be more energised and, um, and, and, and be happier, um, what you need to frame it as, as is um, my students will benefit from an, an energised um, and happy teacher because flexible working will allow me to or um, my students will benefit from, um, from keeping me in the classroom because actually if I can't have flexible working then I can't manage my childcare and I can't come back to work. So um, important to, to, to start with the students and then follow on with you rather than start with you and not consider the students. Um, also important to consider your own flexibility. This is a negotiation process, not a yes, no process. So if what you suggest uh, to begin with they can't give you everything that you've asked for, then we'll look at um, a little bit later in the session about where you might be willing to compromise, but also where your non-negotiables are and actually the things that you're not really fussed about that you can sort of give a little bit. Um, and also be prepared to offer creative solutions. So if you are the first person requesting flexible working at your position um, or at your level in school, um, how else are other people doing it? Get some stories um, from our networks here, from each other, um, do your research. There's lots of stuff available online um, so that you can say, well, this is how it's being done by somebody else in a similar position in this school um, and it works. So just to be aware that often denying flexible working practices is grounds for indirect sex discrimination. So it's indirect because uh, it's not something, it's not a comment or a behaviour that is directly discriminatory against you. So it's it's not a direct comment such as, um, we don't think you're as ambitious as you used to be because now you're a mum, for example. Um, it's a system, a framework that is more likely to disadvantage women because women are still, according to the Office of National Statistics, more likely to take on the domestic and childcare responsibilities and that includes sandwich caring where um, women take on, I think, something like 75, 60 or 75% of caring for elderly or, or unwell relatives. So because the way our society is structured, um, organisations that deny flexible working have structures that are indirectly discriminatory. This could also um, mean if schools are denying leadership positions on flexible hours, then they're essentially saying that the reason you need flexibility is because you're a woman, you're more likely to take on these caring responsibilities, but we won't have you as leadership on flexible working hours, which means that we won't have women with, we're less likely to have women in, in leadership positions. Um, and we're more likely to have men who are less likely to take on the caring responsibilities. So, um, and that leads to the gender pay gap and this um, educational, this gender inequality in school leadership, which is particularly prominent at secondary level. Now, when it comes to TLR payments, this is a particularly tricky issue. Um, according to the Teachers Paying Conditions document, if you have a TLR, so a uh, maybe a key stage lead or a phase lead or a head of department, um, you are paid pro rata. So, for example, if you are granted 0.6 as a head of English, um, you would be paid 0.6 of your TLR, uh, but you might still be doing the whole TLR. Legally, it's in the teachers' paying conditions document, so your union will come back and tell you this, uh, your school will come back and tell you, tell you this, but obviously we can see there that that's another example of systemic um, sort of in, indirect discrimination 
because um, again, it's more likely that women are going to work flexibly. So we're asking them to do unpaid labor. Um, and that is actually written into our paying conditions that that unpaid labor is expected if we're working flexibly. So there's a negotiation to happen around the TLRs um, and flexible teacher talent who are an organization who are working uh, work in this area of flexibility and education have actually written to the Secretary of State about it and said, you know, we need to challenge this because it's, it's discriminatory and this is part of the thing, the reason that we have a gender pay gap in education. Um, and I mean, in terms of your school's interest and the DfE's interest, flexible working, it's a key retention tool um, for, for colleagues, particularly over um, the return to work period and for colleagues who have um, caring responsibilities. So the reason that there's so much push on flexible working, uh, especially in the last five years, is because all the research says that it's the way that we, we keep experienced teachers, particularly uh, mothers or particularly millennials who uh, want different types of working conditions uh, in the workforce. So having had um, that sort of legal information, um, the situation right now in, in schools uh, looks like this with the fantastic little graph or uh, table from Lindsay Patience of Flexible Teacher Talent, who I mentioned. So you can see there that um, we, as an industry, um, are still not doing flexible working, uh, particularly predominantly. So maximum just over a third of our primary and nursery teachers are working part time. And when we get to leadership positions, we're really dropping down to sort of less than a fifth of all teachers are working as assistant heads and it, and it gets worse as we go up to headship. Um, however, the good news is that, um, well, it depends how you see it. Um, part of the good news is, is that uh, where teachers work part time and flexibly in um, nursery and primary schools, 86% um, of those are positions are held by women. And there's actually a positive uh, gender pay gap there. So you're more likely to get paid plus 2.4% more as a woman working part time as a primary teacher or a nursery teacher than a man working part time. Um, however, at secondary level, it's a very different story. 69% um, of those 23% of classroom teachers who work part time or flexibly are women, and um, they suffer from a 14.2% gender pay gap in comparison to their male class teacher counterparts at secondary level. So it's, it's interesting looking at the stats there because it gives you a realistic pi picture of, of what you are asking for and, and where you are fitting within this sort of the demographics of teaching and leadership part time and flexibly. The good news is that, that things are changing and that there are lots and lots of fantastic role models who are who are doing things really well out there. And we'll see some of them later. Um, and sometimes you just got to be the change. So um, I'm going to give you three minutes now um, to get into the chat, please. Uh, so staying on mute, but three minutes. If there's anything that uh, any questions that you had, any stories of success from yourself or your colleagues, your wider networks that you'd like to share to keep us buoyant. Any requests for contact details or repetition that you need, or any specific um, barriers that you're thinking, well, you know, this is what's happening in my setting, or this is what I'm faced with. Um, any any tips or advice there? So in the chat, please, I'll give you three minutes to get those ideas in the chat. So thanks for the first two comments coming in. Is it more likely for a request to take effect from the middle of the school year to be refused? Not necessarily. Um, sometimes school anticipate you coming back 
flexibly a part-time. There are sort of stereotypes surrounding mothers that every mother wants part-time work when they don't. So um, they, they might have been considering that um, in their contingency planning there. Um, and also, you know, there are different sort of ebbs and flows in, in the school year that might mean that, that actually that flexible working request is very convenient. Um, they might be able to put an advert out to start uh, in the middle of school year to cover any responsibilities they, they have, or, you know, there might be an opportunity for somebody to step up. Um, uh, so no, not necessarily, but it's, it's worth having the conversation about what's convenient for them and whether that is something that is convenient for you. Um, we're enjoying seeing the various possibilities of options of flexible working. Yep. Secondary school head of de department. Brilliant. So um, we will see some different models and I'll be talking about different models today. But I mean, flexible working can even mean um, working full time, but having a late start once a week to drop your child off at school if you're not teaching that period, for example, or if, if you're TA or if you're in primary, if you, that's your non-contact time. So lots of different ways to, to work flexibly that might not actually be as onerous on the school or as scary as they think it's going to be. So when we clarify later exactly what it is that you need, um, you might not actually be asking for much and it might make a huge difference. Um, yes, so part-time working because of things like, it says, um, I was told informally that the admin for part-time teachers costs the school more, therefore it isn't in the school's best interest. Is there truth to this? It seems unfair. It is. Un well, it's not unfair because there are, so there are taxes and pensions and national insurance and things when you employ somebody that happens sort of in the background, HR deal with it, that means that yes, sometimes two people can be slightly more expensive than, than one person because there's a doubling up of the um, of the taxi HRE stuff. Um, but it also costs a great deal of money to recruit somebody and to train them up uh, whilst they don't know your systems and you lose out on the expertise and the relationships and the teaching and learning, the pastoral impact that a familiar teacher has. Um, when teachers are burning out constantly or on absence, um, you know, here and there because they're exhausted, because they can't sustain um, their workload, that costs the school money as well. So um, it's, it's about thinking about the longer term uh, rather than the sort of immediate barriers of all oh, it's going to cost us, you know, a little bit more money a year. In the long run, it's going to save teachers and schools money to, to have a loyal member of staff um, who is, you know, in it for the long game. Um, legalities cover independent schools. All of these legalities are on the gov.uk website, so they're not specific to, um, to even to schools, they're specific to all industries. So if you are an employee, um, that's what the legalities are, uh, they cover. My setting has already told me they prefer not to have job share roles as this is inconsistent for children. Anyway, I'm spinning this, I'm already offering. There's a research report that I will write down to share with you that um, explored the impact of job shares on teachers. Uh, on students and parents and parents' perceptions. Um, it's fairly old, it's done in Scotland, I think, uh, and it just demonstrates that it has absolutely no difference at all. Um, and a lot of the time, having job shares actually brings students a richer experience, um, particularly at, well, secondary job shares are slightly easier to do, um, but at primary, that's where people get a bit edgy about it, like, we have this idea that primary students need one teacher, but in fact they go off for they go off for interventions, they go off for subject specific teaching. Um, when they go into secondary, they're going to go from you know one or two teachers to twelve. So um, yeah, the research says that it doesn't have an impact actually. Uh, I'm applying for a new job on a part time basis. Any tips about what aspects I should consider asking about? So if you if the job is advertised part time, um, when we get to sort of our, we'll do a sort of planning bit later in here. And I think some of the questions that, that will come out of that, that you're like, these are the specifics. Um, if the job is advertised full time, go for it anyway. When you get offered it, negotiate the flexible working um, because otherwise you may be falling at the first hurdle because of discriminatory environments. I mean, if you if you do, then you don't want to work there anyway. So up to you how you how you play that. But it can open up opportunities if you just keep that to yourself for a little bit. Um, staffing levels in and outside the department affect a decision. Yeah. And I think we have to be empathetic of school leaders and, and, and department leaders here is that they're constantly playing jigsaw puzzles with their staffing. So that's why it is this sort of negotiation situation, because 
sometimes you know, a last minute request can really throw a spanner in the works of an enormous picture. And as, as willing as they might be to, to accommodate you, there might be only so many things they do if somebody else has just announced a, uh, a pregnancy or if somebody else. So I fell victim to two people got their requests in in January and then I asked in May and my head teacher said, well, why didn't you ask me in January? And then I would have hired a new person. Um, so they got, they got there before me. Um, so yeah, things like that can affect the outcome. Um, and I'm using their, their partner's account. Head of English with a 10 week old looking to explore possibilities. Lots of excellent women with big TLRs at my school go to 0.8 after having children, but end up doing the whole role and being quite stressed, keen to avoid this. Success story, my school recently hired a 0.6 assistant head. So brilliant, it can exist. Um, and with the TLRs, I think um, if your school are not willing to pay you the whole TLR when you negotiate that, um, then I would look at breaking down exactly what that TLR requires, getting rid of all the stuff that you don't want to do. So if it's a, if you're 0.6, for example, getting rid of the 0.4 that you don't want to do and putting it in a list and actually framing it as this is an excellent opportunity for somebody to gain experience that will stand them in good stead for their progression. Because it's likely there's somebody in your department who actually wouldn't mind taking control of the spreadsheets um, for the data input and doing some of that legwork for you because it will give them on their CV um, experience of whole department data or somebody who wouldn't mind uh, managing all the, the trips admin because that's quite exciting to them. And that can even be um, roles that NQTs or ECTs can take on um, as long as you are thinking carefully about what you're delegating to who. Um, equally, you can say, well, you know what, I need a deputy in my department. I think this person would be great at the job. And if we paid them slightly more or negotiated to pop them up a few points on the pay scale, then I think they would be happy to be remunerated because it would be a great experience for them if they're looking to progress to head a department later on in their career. So the great thing about flexible working is the contingency planning and the development opportunities that it offers other members of staff as well. And I, I personally, having having led staff members, think that that's really exciting um, to be able to offer people that opportunity so that they stay rather than getting bored in their class teacher position and, and wanting to move elsewhere. So um, we're going to jump into, thank you for those questions, really great. Um, we're going to jump into breakout rooms now. And a question that I'd really love you to, to just talk to your new friend, your new networking partner about, is just why you want to work flexibly. What is it about flexible working that appeals to you? And whether it's a, a want or a need, um, because we might have different things going on there, um, just let them, let them know who you are and why you want to work flexibly. You are in groups of twos and threes. It'd be great if you could have cameras on so people know who they're talking to. I'm going to give you five minutes for this and then I will bring you back in. So why do you want to work? Oh, there's a baby. Why do you, that's why I want your cameras on as well. Why would you like to work flexibly? Off you go. people not joined are you okay yeah just one person not joined are you okay there we go It's always good when people don't come back in straight away because you know that they've had really fruitful conversations. Uh, just as a reassurance as well, if your cameras are on in the main room, we still can't see you when you're recording. It's just the hosts and the co-hosts that will come up on the recording. Um, entirely up to you. Hope those conversations were fruitful. You've met somebody new today. He's in a similar position to yourself. 
even if you just got to introduce yourself. Whenever we go into breakout rooms, people always say, it's not enough time, not enough time. Okay, we've got everybody back. Welcome, everybody. And just a reassurance that if you're happy to keep your cameras on, you, we, you won't, your face isn't on the recording. Um, it's only the co-hosts and the hosts that are on there. So um, particularly in terms of safeguarding with babies and things on, on screens. So the next section that we're going to think about is, is how we're going to approach flexible working um, and the boundaries that we're going to, to make sure that we've got in place now um, and we'll try to sustain uh, whilst we are we are back at school if we're working flexibly. Now, the reason that um, this is important is because some research that we've done over the last three years into women aged 30 to 39 who have either stayed in or left teaching indicates that flexible working is great, but flexible working can also be done really, really badly um, that still leads to miserable teachers, um, lower paid teachers and uh, teachers who leave. So these are just two sound bites from two separate teachers who had left um, when they were 30 to 39, which is a sort of key demographic for us as the MTPT project, because it's typically the childbearing age or the age that women have um, young families. One said, I was working what I would consider a full time job with just a part time wage. And another said almost exactly the same. It was just creeping into a full time job again, which I felt wasn't sustainable. So when we're thinking about working flexibly, what I really urge you not to do is to think I'm working flexibly because I can't manage my workload. What we don't want you to do is get paid less for doing the same amount of work in order to protect your weekends. But then at the same time, we've all been teachers and we've all maybe had um, leadership responsibilities, TLRs. Um, we know what it is to have our babies at home and, and our children at home and sort of considering how we might manage work, manage home and me time and, and manage to keep everything in the right place can be quite intimidating. So I'm going to share two links um, in the chat with you from uh, members of our community who uh, do work flexibly and part time. Um, and the point of sharing these videos is for you to see that there's, there's not necessarily a right way of doing it, but this gives you an idea of how these two colleagues have done it and how it works for them. So the first is a lady called Kim. The video is about two minutes long um, and as you're watching it I just want you to think well what do I love about that, um, what do I disagree with, which bits would work for me, which bits wouldn't work for me um, and how has that influenced your understanding of what flexible working might look like for you. So I'll give you um, three minutes just to click on that link that I've just shared in the chat, watch the video, have um, some reflection time if you need it. I'll be on mute, but I'll be in the chat if you need me. So three minutes to watch that first video. Hi, I'm really sorry, I can't seem to find the link. Can you see the, I don't know who I'm talking to, but hello. Um, can you see the chat box? Yep, yeah, I've got the chat box open. And then in the chat box, you should be able to see a link. Oh no, it's because I'm only messaging it, excuse me, to one person. That's not helpful at all. Thank you. Can we see that now? Yes. Well done, okay. Thanks. I'll, be, I'll be fair and restart the timer. <laughs> I'm always a teacher, I have a timer for everything. Thank you for drawing my attention to that.
Brill, if, you, if you're not quite finished, please do carry on. But I'm just going to pop into chat now a second video. Thanks to everybody, there we go. Um, for those of you who are either already middle or senior leaders, <clears throat> or those of you who are aspiring to, to middle or senior leadership, this is Lucy, she's an, a 0.8 assistant head teacher. So again, same activity, watch the video, uh, hear about how she does part-time working on her 0.8 and uh, drop down any things that you find inspiring, that you agree or disagree with, or anything that has influenced your understanding of how flexible working will work for you. So three minutes with Lucy. Fabulous. So just uh, in the chat after that last link, I've shared um, three, two reports and one um, article based on some research that Hannah did um, about job sharing specifically at primary level. So for that person who asked the primary job sharing um, question, uh, Caroline McDade, um, Smedley, 1994, and Hannah and Duncan have done research into this area. So um, what I'd love to see in the chat now is just uh, two minutes of everything that you found interesting or that you didn't agree with or um, your impressions of flexible working and how you might do it um, because of the models that you saw there in the videos. So um, I'll read out what you write in the chat. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts.
So agreement there with the idea of protecting that non-working day so that so work doesn't bleed into it. Um, I like the idea of no work on the days, oh, it's gone up, on the days or times not working as otherwise full-time would be preferable. Yeah, I might as well just get paid for it. I think being part-time and having to work on those days would impact my enjoyment of the job and time of the baby. Yeah, I feel like it, like you're you're giving them something that you don't really want to give. It's coercive, isn't it? Um, I love the fact that in both models, they were able to spend time with their children. I disagree with doing work on off days. Um, I like the fact the assistant head consciously switches off her emails and does no work on her day off. Yeah, get rid of those emails on your phone. And, you know, it's your choice whether you access them or not on your laptop on the day off. So just, just don't don't do it. Um, the difference between the videos highlighted the conflict between time to spend with family and time to spend with colleagues. Yeah, so that idea of having a social life at work often has to sort of, you know, where do you fit a nice staff room chat in if you know that you don't want to be working at home and you could be working through that that time. Um, I have to run to sort of, oh, <laughs> um, uh, there's a nappy happening. Um, I like the idea of working 0.8. I think it would be important for me to try to switch off on that day and avoid uh, work during working hours uh, so that I can make the most of spending the day with my son and going to baby toddler groups etc. I definitely want to read and catch up on emails before going into school though so I expect that I might want to give myself an hour or so in the day before I'm in just like I usually would to check if there's anything important yeah and often booking things in specifically for that day means that well that's what that day becomes for and you, you know it's not just sort of what should I be doing right now. Uh, my main role reflex for working would be how would I be able to fully, fully switch off as there's always something to do. It was reassuring to hear that Lucy is able to do it as an AHT. It takes practice, obviously, there's always something to think about, whether that's thinking about home when you're at school or thinking about school when you're at home. But yeah, it does, it does happen, um, just takes practice. I think 0.8 can be difficult if people forget you don't work that day, yeah. Now with that, um, the more you don't reply to your emails on the day that you don't work, the, the quicker people will remember that you don't work on that day. Um, and as long as they don't have your phone number to be calling you and saying, why aren't you in your classroom? Um, then, you know, it, again, it takes a little bit of time, but people get used to it eventually. Um, having the option to either switch off from work completely on days off or spreading work across the week sounds good. This is the definition of flexible. Yeah, I like that. There's the idea that sometimes you'll be able to do it and other times you might choose, you know, to, to, to do a bit of work on your day off so that you can whatever during during your working days so the the point is is that your boundaries are yours um and it's really helpful if nobody else is dictating those to you that you have a sense of autonomy over them um i thought it was really positive and reassuring an aht with flexibility i think i would also feel like i would like to completely switch off especially as she was 0.8 lovely okay so um getting into breakout rooms again and now that you've seen a little bit about what flexible working might mean, just four minutes to tell your partner, well, in ideally, this is the pattern that I would want. So whether that's 0 0.8, 0 0.6, uh, two late mornings, two early finishes, five days compressed into four, um, full time, but one day working from home. What does um, flexible working, what would you like it to look like for you? So back into breakout rooms, I've mixed you up a little bit. Four minutes, off you go. Finding our flexible, flexible working requests. Um, there was just a, a question on the chat. How likely is it that we, when you are part-time, you'd be expected in the commas to do a full-time job? And I'd say to that, well, <laughs> people can have expectations of you if they're reasonable and you meet them great if they're unreasonable and you choose not to meet them then that's uh you know not meeting an unreasonable expectation um so i think again that's about boundaries and confidence um and being clear about what the expectations are of you within the time that you are given um focusing on outcomes um, so in this time what am i expected to produce or do with my students or or my extra responsibilities um, and if you feel that well I can't do those outcomes in the time that I'm working then having that conversation around the expectations there and, and your boundaries and then not being set up to fail essentially but just you know if somebody expects you to work full-time and you're not working full-time then you can just let them have that expectation and carry on with your life um, so I'm going to just model um, a 
one way of doing a flexible working request um, in terms of the planning for the request and getting things clear in your mind. And I'm going to work you through um, what we might consider when we're thinking about non-negotiables, about where we're willing to compromise, um, what SLT might need from you um, and why SLT might be hesitant about giving you um, what you're asking for and then the solutions that you can bring to the table. And really important to remember again that you, you can make this request but putting the request in writing or talking about the request is the beginning of the negotiation procedure. It might be a yes straight away, it might be a no but could we do this, it might be a we'd love to but we can't so what are the solutions. So just anticipate from SLT that if they say no, that doesn't mean that they're awful people who hate you. It might just mean that they need a little bit more uh, flexibility and adaptation from you and you need to do a bit of work together. So over my career, I worked full time all the way up until my second child was two. Um, and then because the MTPT project grew to a certain capacity and um, I wanted a day off to look after the MTPG project so my reasoning wasn't really around childcare um, but it did mean that I could um, collect my son from school and drop him off in the morning and do the nursery run which was lovely and um, spend a little bit more time with them. Um, so when I, I initially made that request in May 2020 and um, my head teacher said, I've just given part time to two other members of your department in January. Um, that's when I make the timetable. So if you if you want this, please don't ask, don't put it in writing now. Um, ask me by next January and we'll see what we can do for for next year. No, I asked in 2019. So then in the September of 2019, I put my request in for the September 2020 so that he, he had it all year to consider how we would deal with that. So in September 2020, I went down to uh, four days a week. Um, and for me, the non-negotiables was that I, and I was a lead practitioner and I was in charge of ITT and um, eventually line managed EAL and was sort of one of the stronger members of the department. So for me, my non-negotiables was that I wanted a full clear day off. Um, I didn't want to be sort of doing any late starts, early finishes really, because I knew knowing me, I would just, carry on working or get caught in a conversation or make myself a cup of tea and then not actually do anything. Um, I wanted to retain my lead practitioner role and my pay scale. I didn't want to do anything less than 0.8 because we couldn't afford it. Um, and I didn't want uh, a mentee. So all my life I've been the mentor to, to a trainee. Um, and actually that was a, a real drain um, in terms of time and capacity. And I knew that if I didn't have a mentee, I was just doing the oversight of the ITT, then that would uh, free up a lot of time for me, even though I love having a mentee. Uh, my compromises were that I didn't have a, a set day. My children were in school by that time or nursery five days a week, so it didn't really matter which day um, off I had. Um, there were some aspects of the ITT role that I was really willing to relinquish, so I managed schools direct, teach first, PGCE, and um, sort of new um, foreign trained teachers. Um, and then I wasn't fussed about the PGC, for example, it was always a small cohort. Um, I was happy to fill my lead practitioner responsibilities as requested. My role mostly involved doing what my head teacher told me to do um, on a termly basis and getting good at things quickly. Um, I was willing to wait for a September start um, to, to make sure that that was what, what worked for the school. Um, I was happy to share classes with less experienced colleagues and trainees. In fact, I quite enjoyed doing that. So I didn't, you know, I wasn't fussed about having my own classes um, or, or sharing classes there. So my plan A, and I really encourage you as you're listening to me going through this story, um, to be jotting down your own ideas of your plan A, your plan B, your plan C, if you're able to. Um, if you're not, I would advise when you're talking in breakout rooms to, to record yourself on your phone if your hands are otherwise taken up so that you've got a, a recording um, of what you've said. My plan A was retain my full LP role, have a full day off, definitely be teaching year 11 um, because I knew that exam classes and data sets would be important in terms of progression and evidencing my skill set uh, in the future. Have full or near full classes, so I appreciate that maybe across eight lessons one might be taught by another teacher um, and not having a formal mentee. My plan B, if they couldn't give me that, was that I would relinquish my responsibility for the PGC students and that actually maybe one of the trainee LPs um, would 
take on the PGCE paperwork and, and the managing the PGCE mentors. Um, and I would be happy to sort of step in and support them as they took on that responsibility. Um, I was happy to share my classes, share all of them across two teachers um, and be the lead teacher for those classes. So in this plan B scenario, if year seven had five lessons a week, I would have three in the shed teacher would have two, so I'd still be sort of the main teacher um, there, but I was happy for all my classes to be shared. Um, I was very happy if I was working with a less experienced teacher to act in a mentoring role there. So if I was sharing one of my classes with a salaried school direct trainee, I didn't want them as my mentee, but I was more than happy to provide feedback, provide mentoring, provide support uh, for that trainee or that ECT or that less experienced teacher, uh, less organized teacher, you know, even small things like that. Um, and I was still happy to take on those new LP responsibilities if they thought, well, if you're working 0.8 Emma, the way we've got you set up right now is not going to work. My plan C, um, and you'll hear as I go through it that I'm not in love with it, but okay, fine, we'll work with it for a year. I would have been okay, fine with two afternoons per week, but that would have required some real discipline from me to, to leave the building. Um, I would have been okay with not having year 11 class, but um, I'd have to have a year 10 class to, to make sure that I'm still doing something key stage four. Um, I would be fine with sharing classes across three teachers, so that is, I've done it and it's complicated, but um, I'm strong enough to do that. I was, would be happy to be the second teacher on all the classes, so to be the one that picks up one lesson here, one lesson here and there, one lesson a fortnight, that, that sort of ugh, timetable. Um, and I'd be happy to be the, the key, like a key stage three heavy timetable if that's what was needed. But you can see that the difference between plan A and plan C are I'm not in love with plan C, but you know, it doesn't, doesn't, it's only one thing of my non-negotiables that it, that it um, compromises, which is the full clear day off. So having heard that, what I'd love you to do in your breakout rooms is is run through your plan a your plan b and your plan c with your with your partner um, again if you can write that down amazing if you can't because your hands are taken up then um, get into the voice notes on your phone and just record that conversation for yourself so that when you do have a quiet moment with a cup of tea um, and baby sleeping you can um, do it in pretty stationary um, but yeah i'll pop you into breakout rooms so what would are the plan a the plan b and the plan c for your flexible working that you would be suggesting to your uh, line manager or SLT. I'm gonna give you six minutes for this, maybe seven with a group of three. Um, I'm just gonna, Joe, I'm gonna pop you into the group of three just in case you are still managing baby. Um, there we go. Off you go. And our hashtag. Um, our, it would be really, really great if you could um, share, because we know that people, um, all of these events that we're doing are, are free, um, but if people don't hear about them, they can't benefit from them. Um, so please do give a shout out. Um, we've got another event with Pioneer in March, similar to so a repeat of this, Flexible Teacher Talent are doing lots of events as well um, with Pioneer um, and then the Flexible Working Ambassador schools around the country are also doing different events. So keep an eye on at the TCPD and see what's available for you. Um, and if you are based in Berkshire, the county of Berkshire in particular, we've also got some funding for our parental leave group coaching workshops that are starting in February as well as our return to work workshops. Next one is in, oh, in January, 31st of January. So um, they don't focus on flexible working, those ones, but Berkshire teachers in particular, we have funding available. Um, if there is anything that you need before we go, then please do, do drop something in the chat. Otherwise, thank you very much and have a lovely rest of the day.